we've got all the players in here now. We're all ready. Hopefully, everyone else is ready on the right sides, and we should be good to go. So any second now, we'll head into Champion Select. I mean, let's move to four. Players, these all know each other. They do have a good idea of what they play, what they don't play, who they want to get rid of. Obviously, everyone knows the, the Anivia from Frog, and everyone knows the Lee Sins and the likes. There is the Champion Select. So there's a couple of the expected bands. There's a couple that I think that might just surprise us. And our first one is going to be Zyra, which we saw yesterday get banned out against and rated. That was one of the biggest things, him playing her as support. But honestly, there was no one on that... Uh, 7C6 Seaman lineup, which I personally know them for a Zyra. We've got JWoww in there, we've got JRE in their support, and Cottonex in their jungle. But Zyra wasn't one of the, uh, the first things that came to mind personally. So CLG have definitely done their research on these players. Well, it, it showed yesterday as well, you know, with a lot of the bands that CLG were putting down, even games just a week ago, you know, within a week seeing all right, we see who teammates they were doing and who they were using to great effect, and just removing those champions from the pool. And you can see once again, the Nunu being removed as well as Lee Sin. So those high impact, high uh, uh, early game champions have been removed from the game. Over on the flip side, Anivia, Irelia, and Blitzcrank. So, you know, again, three arguably targeted bands. It removes that very aggressive support. It removes, obviously, Wicked's Irelia and the Frog Anivia, which everybody has come to know and love. And uh, first pick, Ezreal. So, so far, we're 100% of the games. He's only been banned once, but every other game has been played thus far at uh, DreamHack Winter. Yeah, he was picked in the first five and banned in the last one. So we'll see if that keeps on the trend today. We've got a lot more games. We have the potential of 12 straight games today. Three from the group stage and then three best of three matches in the semis and the final. So lots of League of Legends left to come your way. We're going to be here all day long in the Dream Arena, hopefully with this lovely crowd here for the entirety. We'll see. Yeah, that is for sure. And we've got to give props to everybody here. It's 11 o'clock in the morning, not even yet, and we've got a, almost a full house. So guys, can we get a cheer for the Dream Arena? That's what I like to see. While we've been chanting, Olaf and Corky have been locked in. Corky seems to be the secondary AD, uh, AD carry of choice at this event. Every time Ezreal has been picked up or locked in, we have seen that Corky being preferred. We've seen Vayne once or twice uh, picked up by Reckles, of course, and uh, once or twice Graves. I think only in the one game. But nevertheless, more often than not, we're seeing the Phosphorus Bombs matching up against those Mystic Shots in the bottom lane. Yeah, the, the power of those two escapes, the Valkyrie and the Arcane Shift, it's so good up against any kind of support you put up there. Even though it's Blitzcrank, that grab, that long range, pulling you in, knocking you up. Arcane Shift or a Valkyrie mid-animation is going to get cancelled. You're going to get out of it. None of the other AD carries quite have that versatility. Vayne, as you said, Rickles picked that up. She can do it. She can tumble away from this CC, but you have to be right on the ball, and you have to be very, very acute and accurate in the way you use this. So it takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice. Rickles, he's comfortable with doing that. Not every AD is. So that would explain why he's the only one to pick it so far. But CLG have locked in the rest of their bottom lane, and it is going to be Creepo on Leona again. Yeah, so we're going to see once again that very aggressive support. Zenith Blades into the Shield of Daylight, uh, Daybreak, rather. You know, Solar Flares, it's, we know Creepo likes to play aggressive. We know he likes to dive, 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 and push, push, push. We've seen yesterday uh, going behind, you know, mid lane towers, between the first and the second tower, trying to open up with the Solar Flare. It didn't yield any kills at the time yesterday, but maybe a couple more games of practice, warming up to the setup, warning up to the rest of his team. And today, you know, if he lands them, it could be changed game-changing ultimates. We see on the other side, though, Shen and Janna have been locked in, so that's most likely going to be a Janna corky bottom lane. Probably Shen in the top lane and Olaf in the jungle, but again, those two champions, they're interchangeable. It can depend on how the Seaman want to play this one out and where they're going to put their, uh, their champions. I really like that Janna pick. A lot of people don't realize it, but if you land a Zenith Blade on Leona, if you get knocked up halfway through the travel using a tornado from Janna, it's going to cancel it. You're not going to arrive at your target. You're not going to have to land that stun. And it can really disrupt the way Leona works, especially if you then have to use the ultimate on top of it from Janna and pushes her back again. It keeps her right away from the AD carry. It gives Jerry lots of opportunities here to completely outplay Kripo. But vice versa, it does the same back to Kripo. So we could see a lot of interesting play from both of these supports and the rivalry, which we already know is there. Yeah, and I'm so excited to see the champions again that have just been locked in. Lux and Rumble. Rumble is one of my favorite champions in this game. He's such a pleasure to play and a really a, a fun champion to watch, you know, because he's very, very aggressive. That equalizer of his, as soon as you see those line missiles going down, I prefer the pineapples from the Rumble in the jungle <laughs> skin. But it's such a cool champion. The thing that's interesting about this is just the amount of line AoE damage. True Shot Barrage, Final Spark, Equalizer. You know, all in conjunction. If somebody gets caught by a Rapture, 
They eat all of that damage. There's, it's going to be a guaranteed. And that's excluding the snare, the slow from solar flare, the light bindings. It's a great combination of ultimates and, and aggressive plays. The flip side, of course, is you do have Monsoon from Janna. If anybody's relatively close, you can just knock them away, make those skill shots a little harder to, to land when you're being tossed all over the map. You've got the Stand United from Shen, and of course, the highly mobile you know, Diana, Olaf, and, and uh, Corky, who can just dash away and run away from the CC. What worries me a little bit here, from the 7CC Siemens point of view, is that COG have a very similar comp to what we saw them going to 52 minutes with yesterday. If they cannot find a way to burst through that very tanky lineup that was just sitting there absorbing poke, absorbing poke, slowly just pushing you off of objective, taking a turret, taking a dragon, taking a turret, picking one or two people off with lasers and frogging, then they're just going to result in a very slow, methodical defeat like we had yesterday. If the Siemens can find a way to burst through and uh, just jump onto COG, then they're going to possibly be able to turn this around, but they need to do it early. They look at the champions again on COG. We've got Cho'Gath in there very, very strong later on. Ezreal very strong later on. Rumble just going to get very tanky on top of the high damage that he already has. And if they wait too long, you're going to hit that point where COG just won't die from the initial burst that um, the certain seamen have. And Corky it's not quite going to match up to the output Ezra is going to have. Yeah, it's so true. So we'll see how this one plays out. We're about to pull up the loading screen for the first game today at the DreamHack League of Legends Championships. And I want to get see, see who's, who the crowd favors here because we've got the local boys and we've got the world stars. So who here is voting for Hu 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 Hu, man? I like it. I like it. I don't know if they got confused by my terrible pronunciation or not. And now let's see, can we hit a cheer for Counter Logic Gaming EU? Uh, I think that's about the same, Panky. I think I that's think about on par. If anything, the local boys took that. It's true. It's true. It's close. It's rooting for an upset. Fifty-five percent to forty-five percent, and we're going to be keeping you, uh, you know, entertained with the lowbrow humor all day long. The semen bursting through. That was a, a subtle one, thank you. A subtle one. So, loading screen. Gentleman Chogath once again. But we do see Pentakill Olaf on the bottom lane, as well as Earth Rider Corky. I have to give the skin war to the semen. <laughs> I'm going to keep giggling at this all day. Because right. I'm 12. Yep, it's the only way. You know, you've got to have a bit of sense of humor when you've got names like that in gaming. So we've updated our scoreboard very, very quickly. We haven't seen a lot of level one engagements thus far in the lands. Um, nobody really wanting to overcommit or put themselves in a position where they can immediately you know, give away one or two kills and give up that early game, give up that lane presence that they might have. The seam in a defensive start over by the red buff, and CLG just covering all of the entrances to their own jungle. Yeah, as you said, there's, there's one exception to these teams that haven't wanted to do this level one fight so far in the tournament, and that's been Fnatic. We saw earlier on, we said on Monday, we cast an online tournament for, uh, for Fnatic themselves, they were running their own one, and they were very aggressive there. Won a game in 11 minutes because Rick was picking up kills in the first two minutes, picking up a double and an assist. Off the back of that, they've kept coming on through here yesterday, running the likes of Blitzkrieg, running very aggressive supports and strong level one teams. They started to do it again. They didn't necessarily always pick up first blood or four kill, first kills, but they were just good jungle objectives. They would yeah. disrupt their opponents, and that alone would allow them to take an early lead and then capitalize on it. Yeah, especially when you consider that they were moving. It was a calculated move. You know, they, It was very, very clear that Fnatic had a clear goal in mind. They were moving for a specific objective. They were moving to disrupt a specific champion, and they were moving to get information and uh, reconnaissance on their enemy. So it was really good play. I'd like to see whether or not that's actually going to make any difference once we start getting to the later stages of this tournament because Fnatic are of course 2-0 which puts them in a good position to qualify. Nevertheless, the 1 minute 50 second mark is about to approach. Some minions have spawned, jungles have started to be cleared out and the only wards on the minimap right now are sitting near the blue buff for CLG where they've warded their own and over at the top, a delayed invade coming in from CLG here. I see the Crescent Stripe going out. I don't know if the vision was given. Jay Rikesh and Kotnex immediately starting to fall back. Take a look at the vision. This is going to be four versus three. Kotnex may be in trouble. Light Binding goes out. Doesn't manage to catch onto anybody. Kotnex is going to be forced to flash to safety. Ignite is ticking away. He does give up first blood. And it goes to Froggen on Lux as well. So not only have they disrupted that blue buff and prevented, them from, uh, prevented Olaf from picking that one up, but they pick up first blood and two assists across the board. Yeah, just staying a little bit too late, taking one too many auto attacks before he flashed away, and that last tick of Ignite 
did the job it needed to. Snoopy did that Wraith Camp, so they were getting XP despite the delayed invade, so they weren't waiting around doing nothing for quite so long. Got that experience, then got in for the blue buff, managed to steal that away. And now, of course, he can go back to his own jungle, clear his own camps, and have three big buffs worth of experience as opposed to just the two you would normally. It's going to put Cod next behind. But he's on OLAP, he's got a decent jungle clear this time, using that W, using that uh, Q. He's going to be able to clear out these camps very, very quickly. Should be able to catch up with some speed, but it is going to hinder his early ganking ability. Olaf, he's not the strongest. He doesn't have that solid CC. He doesn't have a stun. He doesn't have a knock-up. But with those undertoes, if you can keep chaining them, you can still be very, very effective in the early levels. He He's now not going to be able to do that because he doesn't have that blue buff. Yeah, and the benefit as well, if he does go into any of the lanes, Diana's got a slow, Shen's got a taunt in the bottom lane, there's a slow and a knock-up. Now in the middle, Rupture goes down, followed up with a feral scream in just a second. Sivan's, uh, uh, mm, excuse me there, flash away to safety, gonna get out of range. Rupture in the background, not gonna land. And he has me trying to say another Swedish name, instead of just pronouncing the champion. How on earth do you say that? Sebastian? I think we'll get that from him after this. We'll, we'll go with Sebastian. I'm, I'm, I'm Anglo-Saxonizing it. There we go. It's gonna work for me. Down in the bottom lane, we do see the Howling Gale goes, knocks up both Crepo and Yellow Peeper. They carry on with the aggression, landing Misty Shock, auto attack after auto attack. Now in the top lane, once again, even more action as Wicked is on the back foot. Undertow lands, red buff ticking away, reckless swing lands. Just gonna land one of those Electro Harpoons and get away just losing a chunk of HP. Yeah, does put him down a little bit. He's gonna have to go through those health potions and slowly put him back behind Shen. And Shen, of course, he's gonna start scaling up. He's gonna be able to start harassing with that Vorpal Blade and he's gonna get a lot of sustain from it. We saw that in the previous game, how you had champions that were previously getting a bit of an advantage over Shen, getting a slight lead for leading him back to his turret. It suddenly switched around once he started hitting level 6, level 7, and started to scale up. And of course, at that point, he's then going to grab his ultimate, and he's not going to need to leave the lane for anything other than to shot. And then he's going to go and help his teammates win the fire star. Wicked doesn't have that global presence himself. He's going to have to leave this lane and roam down whenever COG wants him to fight. So he's going to teleport or anything like that. And we know how COG the last couple of days were looking to try and take some quick dragon. But we do see the taunt going out from JWL, landing on the Wicked. Kodnik's been waiting this whole time. The Ignite is ticking down. The Reckless Swing's already gone out, and Wicked will fall under the top turret. And that is a huge cheer as the Seaman pick up their first kill of the game. Evening it up one to one. Only 200 gold difference between them right now. But it's a really great play from Kotnex. Hanging around in that top lane. He was chilling in the grasses, waiting for a setup. Gonna dive under the tower. Shadow Dash taunt. Damage reduction's out. Rupture comes out. Feral scream from Snoopy. Tower hits is on j -Well. He uses the feint, but it's not gonna be enough. They trade one for one. And Snoopy not doing bad in that engagement. Yeah, slight mistake there from the 76 team and just grouping up too close. If they'd stayed spread, that knockup would have only hit the one of them. Would have been JWL who would have died anyway, but Kotnik would have got out with a little bit more HP. But needless to say, he survived, so couldn't have been too much better. Two to two though, even on gold across the board. And if we actually have a look, I have a range of my score, but slight lead in actual fact in the bottom lane for Quarky yet. He's only very minor and there's a wave here for Yellow Pete under the tower, so he sh should catch up soon. But despite the aggression we've seen, despite uh, Leona landing plenty of Zenith blades and stuns across the uh, two members of the Seaman bottom lane, it's been fairly even and fairly close. The thing that's interesting about this matchup now, in terms of the kills, you've got one kill on Cho'Gath, one kill on Lux. So obviously Froggen's going to be happy with that bonus first blood gold. The thing is, Shen has both of the Seaman's kills, so this is going to put him a little bit stronger. Shadow Dash taunt, Wicked takes one hit from the tower, now they've turned the tension. Undertow goes across, he's going to pick up his axe. Reckless Swing is down, Vicious Strike's ticking. Undertow should be available shortly. Actually, I believe he just missed his axe. And that didn't reset the cooldown, and that was why Olaf wasn't able to stick. And that's a situation, like he points it out, there's no hard CC. Once the taunt from Shen had worn off, there was nothing else to hold Rumble in place. And he could literally just walk away from that with, uh, you know, just taking a little extra poke or a little more damage than he would have. If Shen does continue to pick up one or two more kills and becomes, you know, this tanky, unkillable monster, it's really going to play into the favor of the Swedes because, of course, they're just going to allow, you know, keep split pushing, keep fighting, keep picking four versus five engagements and allow Shen to join in later with Stand United. Yeah, so let's have a look at the mid lane. Frogging today has that first blood from the invade here. 46 hits to 39. Isn't too far apart, but he's doing a good job at harassing Diana as things continue. Try and find the right button. There we go. Frogging, he has just hit level 6. He's going to have that laser, which is a little bit before Diana. Blue buff should be respawning somewhere in the next 10, 15 seconds. And we already saw yesterday Frogging and Extinct in that fact, blind stealing that blue with a laser. Yeah, but there it is it no war here for us as COD, but they did know when it respawned. Snoopy was around the half of the map. He has now 
vanish from vision, but he's making his way in there to plant another ward in that bush. So they're planning to do something towards this blue when it respawns, whether it be complete in favor of the squad or whether it just be frogger, we'll have to wait and see. I'm just taking a look up at the top lane, both Wicked and JWoww going head to head. Flame Splitter facing off against the Vorpal Blade, trading damage back and forth. Neither champion using mana, so they're literally just reliant on their energy and cooldowns and of course heat for a rumble. A little bit of poke back and forth and Cottonex, he smells a little bit of blood. Level 6 is not yet picked up by Wicked. JWoww does have Stand United, he's just hit it and you can see Olaf has managed to sneak all the way into that secondary bush. The problem is, there's a huge, huge, huge creep wave to Wicked's advantage. So, unless they're going to consider going for another tower dive, um, you know, Wicked's just going to be able to sit back and play it safe. Maybe throws out the equalizer. And in the bottom lane, Jerry got caught up by a stun. Long range ultimate from Crepo. Did then get in range with the Zinni's blade, but could not quite finish it off with the help of Yellow Peter. Did not have that damage to get through Jerry, but in the top lane, Wicked uses equalizer down onto the tail end of Jerry. Wow, Knockup is going to land from Snoopy, but they're not going to chase it any further because Cop Next is still up there as well. And while all of that is happening, Sebastian is now deciding he wants to go down to this bottom lane. He snuck into the bottom tri-bush, was looking to set something up in, in anticipation of a dive from CLG, but they did not do it. Electro Harpoon goes out, lands on Cotton X, secondary one lands as well, so both champions trading slows. Again, great exchanges by, by both sides, both creating opportunities, creating possibility for a kill. Laser goes out, and it's stolen, and it is stolen. Froggen with yet another steal. I think he's going to be challenging Cyanide's record for buff steals. He's definitely on the ball with that laser. Has that damage down perfectly. As we do see Creeper going in onto Ketra in the bottom lane, lands the Zenith Blade in the stunt, takes one turret shot and immediately backs away. Just a little bit of harassment down there as the supporters had to leave. Jerry was too low to stick around for much longer. So making the most of that one. But Diana pushing up that mid lane. Frog and playing it very safe, just firing out singularities from a distance, firing out bindings from a distance to CS. Now he's got that blue buff, he can spam his abilities in Cotton while trying to get close, just has no opening. And Diana's uh, been doing very well as far as farm is concerned. 75 to 65, when you consider that Lux picked up first blood as well as has that huge range advantage. You know, to be only 10 CS behind is not bad at the 10 minute mark. We also know that uh, Froggen in particular is really, really great at picking up those Wraith Camps and picking up the jungle mobs when they're available. We've seen it displayed yesterday when he actually stole away the enemy's Wraith with the Lucent Singularity, tossing it out, using like the top edge through the wall and stealing away that big Wraith. So, you know, it's, 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 it bodes well for the Seaman right now. If they can keep the pace going the way it is, they're keeping up with gold, but they need to start turning these uh, uh, engagements into kills because the longer the game goes, the, the more difficult it's going to be to uproot this really tanky, beefy, damage-dealing front line of CLG. Quicker than using his ult in the top lane just to help push this wave up and get it into the turret so he can base and go and shop. But once again, Cotton X is up there, and that really seems to be the way the Seaman want to play. They're camping, sitting on Wicked, just not letting him do too much else other than just gently farm push the lane. And then every chance he's up there, Cotton X is up there, and now shoving into the turret. And it looks like they actually might want to try and take this. The bank very aggressive, even smites away the cannon. But, uh, we'll wait and see Creeper flashing forward onto Kestrel, actually landing the ult. Snoopy's now down here as well. Gonna Valko away from the knockout though. Jerry's been silenced and exhausted, in fact, on the support. Does look like Jerry's the focus. He will fall to Yellow Feet for the third kill of the game for CLG. And that's the first death for Jay Ree over from the Seaman side, CLG EU, and saying, you know what, Crepo wants to put down his dominance as the alpha support, as it were, and we'll see whether or not they can continue this pressure. 11 minutes in, they've started the Drake. Very, very smart ward placement here from the Swedes. You can see it hidden inside that brush, so the pink ward from CLG actually doesn't reveal it. So while that... Uh, the Swedes knew the dragon was going down. There was nothing that they could do. There was no champions nearby, not enough health or abilities. Up in the top lane, Wicked is going to get taunted. We can see Olaf coming up, and a couple of blue pings immediately telling Wicked, Look, just back off, back off. We can see him on the minimap. Don't stay over aggressive when you don't need to. Yeah, JWoww and uh, Kodnik said literally just recalled into the base as well. So when that dragon started, they could not have been further away. Should he didn't know this, but it was a nice timing from their part after killing that support player. JML is still here under the turret. We've still got Wicked playing very, very safe because he can see Cotton next through that tri rush ward. Um, it was something I just I just caught that on stream, exactly how Froggen actually farms up with Lux, and I don't know how many people noticed it, but he lands the light binding across the front two melee minions. Because they're they're snared and they're held in place, the remainder of the wave just starts, you know, backing up and landing behind them. He immediately throws down the Lucent Singularity and catches every single creep in the wave. 
as they're moving around and you know dodging past those snared up melee minions it's such smart play and it gets that passive of his onto every single minion and he can just land the auto attack pop the passive and pick up all the cs in the lane i also like the fact that he's gone for a needlessly large rod top lane once again bruises back and forth it's always the slowest of battles when you're spectating and watching and snoopy wants some blood heading down to the bottom lane again he managed to kill that ward as soon as he's placing his ace. Snoopy's down there, but he's standing on another ward in the river for the semen. So he's safe and clear, but he's got himself an oracles and will take that one down. I've got the gold graphs open here at the moment. If you actually look at the difference between the mid lane, while it's only 20 CS, it is slowly stretching. The global gold is so high that Froggen is nearly 1,200 up over Diana. And that's just going to keep getting bigger the way this guy farms. We do have Kofnex invading in towards the CLG blue buff, and Froggen recalls from actually standing right next to him. So we'll see what kind of loot he managed to pick up here, but as the uh, wolves are the only thing left alive at the moment, we might have to wait a little while before blue buff comes up. But Snoopy is about to come around the corner, sees that the wolves are moving and resetting, brings Wicked in from the top lane. They're going to try and sandwich Cottonix in here. And great play from Cottonix, immediately realizing how much trouble he's in. He does get all caught by the rupture, but the Ragnarok goes down. Equalizer is out. He cannot be slowed. He cannot be CC'd. Swinging those drumsticks, and that was really smart play from Cartnex, immediately realizing that he was in trouble and picking a route that's going to get him to safety. Fair enough, it cost his ultimate cooldown, but that's going to be available again, you know, fairly shortly, and he doesn't give up any more kills or gold than he needs to. CLG are slowly increasing this lead, 18,000 to 16,300. It's not a huge number right now. But the problem is their team is going to scale and be a little bit more difficult to, to delete or to come across to... to defeat once we get that 30, 35, 40 minute mark. Codnex on that base, he bought himself an Oracle's Elixir too, so he's going to be able to take away the CLG wards. And as he comes straight down towards his blue buff, that's perfect timing. CLG had just placed another fresh ward there, trying to give uh, Frog the opportunity to steal this blue again. Snoopy's staying close this time though. His finding's just going to miss past Diana's hair as she goes across towards this blue, but it does look like CLG have decided they're going to give them an up. They have no vision on it this time. They don't want to risk an invade just for this little blue, which they don't really need to keep. And uh, for the first time in this game, Diana does pick it up. Frog and ooh, he lasers it, but it's just a little bit too late. Yeah, almost stealing that laser away. That was a blind guess as well. Froggen's understanding of the damage, how long it takes to pick up that blue buff and you know, when to fire the final spark or not is so, so good. But exactly like you pointed out, CLG realizing that both Crepo and Yellow Pete were a little too pushed up. By the time they could get to the blue buff and react to put some pressure down, it would have been too late. So instead of putting themselves in a disadvantageous position, they just decided to back off and just allow the seamen to you know, do what they do. Now we're going to carry on looking at the pace of the game has slowed down a little bit. We've got those early kills that have been placed across the board. One for Cho, one for Lux, one for Ezreal. And this top lane now looks like it's going a little more in favor of Wicked. You pointed out early on that Shen, you know, he was winning in the early game, but once Rumble gets some items and gets a couple of levels under his belt, he can start turning things to his favor. Wicked's spidey senses are tingling. He immediately backs off, as you can see, both Olaf and Diana are moving up into that lane. They're still hanging around though, so we'll see if they're going to try and bait Wicked into another fight. But nevertheless, the whole time, this pressure, that early game advantage, puts Shen 25 CS ahead of Wicked at the 15 minute mark. Yeah, that Oracle's on Cotton is going to allow him to open up this top lane a lot more now. Obviously, every time Wicked plants a ward, he's going to come in. He's going to kill it. He's going to back away from him a little bit. Then he's going to sneak back in for Wiki as a chance to place another one. They are placing a lot of focus onto this top lane using Cosmex and using that Tola for the moment. But honestly, their other lanes are suffering because of it. Diana slowly falling further and further behind. Yes, it's very hard to gank onto Froggen, but when you've got no left and you've got a Diana, that kind of burst damage, why not come around behind the turret? If you need to, you can pop the Ragnarok, you can take the turret, but they're going into the top lane. JY does taunt onto Wicked. Just uh, Cosmex coming in for a reckless swing and nothing more. They don't want to risk a dive hit. Cosmex does have Ragnarok back up, but he also doesn't want to risk this Oracle. Take a look at this. Diana's moving up from the top. Tribush is about to run into a Snoopy. Snoopy sees him face to face. We see the Luna rush. Crescent Strike goes up. Pale Cascade ticking. The third proc doesn't activate, so no additional shield. Sebastian is now going to back off. And a gentle love tap between friends. Swedish uh, 7C6 Seaman along the lines of that. Once again, Ragnarok being forced by Cottonex just to get away to safety. And you know what? Every time he has to use that defensively against a Rupture, it's not available when he wants it offensively to pick up kills and go for that tower dive. But good map awareness, good control, good calling from CLG to immediately react. Two versus one in the top lane. Snoopy, I need some help. I need some backup. And he immediately responded. It's an interesting build from Snoopy. After the Heart of Gold and the Oracles, he went Mertris and then straight Negatron's Cloak. So very magic resist heavy. 
Do you see that's your fact where he's gonna get taunted again by JY in the top lane. The Volt Blade goes at League Knights taking Cognex is back. It doesn't have Ragnarok, he's taking a lot of damage from that equalizer. He cannot lose this Oracles. The Undertow goes out. There's the Shen Shield. Wick is tanking the turret the entire time. The Volt Blade over the woman with one last reckless swing. Cognex picks up the kill, but there's a laser, and he does just about dodge away from it. Yeah, really, really great positional play there. The Seaman deciding to pick up that kill, or, you know, go aggressive for that kill. They succeeded in doing so. Stand United from Shen was so well-timed. The moment Rumble got out of range, he was overheating. He couldn't use any more abilities. He couldn't use any more Electro Harpoons, and he gave away a kill. So that's three to three. That gold gap is slowly, slowly, you know, staying even. 2,000 gold, it has not expanded for the last six or seven minutes. And you see some more pings from CLG over onto Dragon. With that top lane down with both Olaf and Shen being relatively low, this, they've got a small window of opportunity before the Swedes can react. And they did just clear the, uh, the Dragon pet with that Oracles on Snoopy, but uh, because of doing that, they've given the CC sellers an idea of what's going on. But Jerry's been caught over the wall by Crepo, leaping across, landing the stun, landing his ult. Immediately puts Kestrel and Kopnex into a bad position, but it's now 4v3 for the C6 Sellers. Still want to come in for this. Yellow Pete's very low on mana, but Sebastian's taken very low very quickly. Does leap in on top of him for the move. He's still alive. Now he finally falls down to Yellow Pete. Kestrel's going to get knocked up. He's now got no mana. Flashes over towards the Tribush, down towards bottom lane. Pete's going to come over with him with a laser frog and will execute him through the Tribush. JWoww and Wicked has come down towards the mid lane. They're just trading backwards and forwards. JWoww will use the taunt though for safety. Gets back to his mid turret where Kopnix is waiting. CLG though, are going to pick up their second dragon of the game and they are now three kills in their lead. And that's the Crepo that we've, we've come to know and love. Flashing over the wall, landing the stun, landing the solar flare, locking up members of the Seamen and just completely, completely dominating that fight from the very get-go. As soon as uh, Froggen joined the battle as well, those dark bindings, uh, uh, light bindings rather, just holding everybody in place. And the shield needs to be no noted as well. The prismatic barriers, uh, if you actually look at it, he's put two points into that right now, you know, uh, starting to level up now that his Q and his E are already maxed. And it's a decent shield. Uh, let's quickly look at the numbers really quickly. 182 damage. I mean, that's a decent block, and it goes, you know, out and back across the entire team. It's something that you, you cannot sniff at, and you need to keep remembering that that is in place. Got next takes a little bit of damage there from Foggen. Equalizer comes up from Wicked once again, popping the Ragnarok to get to safety. Laser burst, he sidesteps it. Really well played by Cot next to Duke. That uh, Darth Vader death ray laser from the Death Star. And yeah, looking through the items, you actually look at the difference between Corky now and Yellow Pete. There's a complete bloodthirster and a phage up on Pete. He's 3 0 2 with 140 CS. And there's literally just a phage. It hasn't even got the zeal complete here on poor Corky. So they really need to get some damage out and get some kills if they can onto their AD carry, otherwise their late game is going to fall apart. We've already mentioned how strong CLG's late game is going to become. So, the C6 Sailors, the longer this game is going on, the, s the more it's going in this fashion, they're just going to keep slipping further and further out of their control. They are down by about 3,000 gold at the moment, which isn't too big of a margin. But when you mentioned before, a lot of that is on their AP carry. There's nearly 1,500 difference between Diana and uh, Lux at the moment. And between the AD carries, it's almost 2,000 as well. Those are the worst people to have the gold disadvantages held on. Yeah, that is for sure. And the, the, the gold difference, you could equate it to dragons. So if, you know, if uh, the Swedes decided to put some more focus, put some more pressure on those drakes, actually securing them and not you know, giving away two or three kills when they're trying to challenge, they can balance out these gold numbers. They can bring it back to even. We are still fully in a lane phase game. There are no towers down at 21 minutes. We've reverted to a CLG EU type of playstyle, Season 1 uh, League of Legends competitive playstyle, where there's a long, long, long prolonged farming session, and then all of a sudden everything's going to explode. A team is going to lose one team fight, and it's going to cost them two or three outer towers, or it's going to cost them an outer tower and a Baron or something similar. And that's really when we're going to start to see whether or not uh, the, the, the Sailors are actually up to the task of team fighting against CLG EU, who are battle proven and as hardy as ever. As far as I can see at the moment, their team fights are going to come down to the fact that can Olaf pop his Ragnarok, cause enough disruption in and amongst the back of the team fight as Creeper lands his English blade onto Corky, but he just Valkyries away to safety. But can Olaf get into the backside of the fight? Can he do the damage he needs to really disrupt COG and then allow Corky to clean up and pick up the kills and get the gold for all those? That will just about keep them back into this game. Or even in the same sense, working alongside Diana, the pair of them, Diana and Olaf, both leaping through the backside of the COG defensive line, doing damage to the Froggen, doing damage to uh, Yellow Peak, getting those important kills, and then mopping up the rest of it afterwards. They need those quick burst, deep damage champions to get in there onto COG's carries. But 
as we said, this is CLG EU. They are a very experienced practice team. Trying to get through their front line, trying to get through Wiki, trying to get through Snoopy and Creepo. It's no easy task. And we're going to see some kind of special positioning or some very special play or even a muck up from CLG to allow that to happen. They've jumped onto Sebastian. Take a look at all the damage. One tower hit goes down. Lux picks up the final bit of damage. And a very, very good combination of abilities. Snoopy and Crepo playing so well, waiting it out, waiting for Sebastian to be in a position where he's, you know, he's going to be affected by the silence of Feral Scream, where he's going to be caught by a Light Binding, and then landing the rest of their abilities. So 7-3 to three in terms of kills. The first tower goes down, immediately replied, so it's 1-1 one to one for both teams. But center tower is a little bit more valuable than what the top tower is. The flip side is, of course, this allows Shen to, you know, the split push game is now on. He has that Warmog's armor. We'll see what he's going to decide to build into next. I wouldn't be surprised to see something like a Sunfire Cape or something similar along those lines. And, you know, with Shen split pushing and using Stand United, we've seen it once. At 24 minutes, there has been one Shen ultimate. So you can see how much time these teams are spending focusing on the farm, focusing on the lanes. And I think that uh, the, the, the Swedish team is, is sitting there, the team are thinking, well, let's stick to it. We're, we know what CLG like to do, we don't mind playing the farm game, and let's try play it out, and then we'll pick the engagements that we're comfortable to do. So we'll see whether or not that works out for them. We do have four members of the Seaman down in the bottom lane now, but CLG realize this and have to back away. They also have Wicked and Frogger now closing in on the Cotnex. The binding comes over the wall, there's a singularity and a laser. Does just chunk a lump of Cotnex's health off, but it's nothing too serious. He takes a couple of harpoons on his way out as well, but again, he is out nonetheless. But Sebastian, who will take the next binding and singularity down in the river. There's no laser to follow up on him. But it's still just a little bit of poke here from Frog and nothing too serious. Just to take lumps of their health off, make him a little bit weaker for the next fight should it come on through. So CLG have taken down two turrets now. It's only the top one left standing. It's going to be a little bit harder to do because it is Shen up there. He's just going to keep split pushing and split pushing and keeping those creeps away from his turret. But if they really want it, they can take the three, four members up there and they will shove that straight on home. And if Shen's not careful, he might even die to that. And that would open up a barrier. Yeah, it, it's so true. It's, it's risky, risky, risky positions to be in if they get caught out. But it's going to depend on, you know, the team play is going to depend on whether or not CLG decide to continue farming, which we know that they're probably going to decide to do, in which case we're not going to see those big engagements for a little while. 0-2-0 zero, zero on Wicked. He's going for a very, very aggressive build. Take a look at that haunting guys into Rabadon's death cap. We can see Froggen already, his death cap completed, as well as that Athene's Unholy Grail being matched in farm by Sebastian. So again, the melee champion of Diana is staying up with farm from the very long range uh, uh, auto attack and, and caster of Lux. And we see the Swedes, they're deciding to give a skip on this middle tower and maybe going to push this top lane tower. A lot of CLG pings immediately followed up by the Sailor's pings. They're going to put their attention onto this lane. Can CLG get here in time? We're probably going to see a True Shot Barrage and Final Spark potentially to clear out the creeps if they're available. Instead, they're going to save them and maybe just pick up a fight. There's the True Shot Barrage. Catches a couple of champions. Equalizer comes out. Howling Gale in counter initiates some of that. Crepo flashes over the wall. Shield of Daybreaker catches a Ragnarok. Olaf. Jerry's the focus. He may be the first one to fall. In the background now, Sebastian dropped very low. The laser is going to be duked away. Scott Nex has continued running running for his life. JY now pulling off some aggro. He's over on the right hand side. We're going to stick with the main fight. Going to carry on chasing the rest of this team. Snoopy and Crepo sticking to them. Now we're going to quickly go back to Rumble and JY. It's a combat from the top lane. Shadow Dash taunts over the wall. Electro Harpoon misses. They get away with their life. The 7C6 Seaman with a brilliant, brilliant counter initiation. They got caught by everything. You know, a little bit of an unfortunate stun on the Olaf the very second he pops his Ragnarok. You know, it, it prevented him being locked up, prevented him being held in place. And now we're going to see whether or not this is going to cost them their lives. They're very low. Cotnex goes low. Howling Girl goes up, knocks up Snoopy. Keshla uh, uh, is going to flash to safety after a Valkyrie. They only give away the one kill, trying to secure their own red buff. But overall, not too shabby for the Swedes. Yeah, it was a great disengage to get away from that top fight as Froggen snipes J. Rio under his own turret. Unfortunately, though, for the Seaman. They just couldn't quite slip through Suji's fingers for long enough. They did uh, manage to catch up to them, just keep chasing into that jungle. And now they've picked off those two. There was an Oracle's gone across next. Jerry under his turret. CLG have got free roam to clear all these wards around the Baron pit. I mean, they've opted not to go for it themselves. The has gone down towards the bottom lane. Then blue buff is up. Diana's blue buff is up. Froggen's going to give it a go. Doesn't quite pull it off this time, though. Diana actually managed to pick it up. The laser not doing quite as much damage as Froggen thought this time around. That or Diana. Took it a little bit slower than he thought, but this has opened up Pete and Kripo to push into the top lane and finally try and take down this third turret. Well, they changed their mind just as I say that. Thanks, guys. 
and just those small differences, you know, the fact that Corky did not have his Trinity Force completed, he was, you know, one item behind, they didn't have enough time of Corky on that tower. They revealed the Gambit too early. Shen and Olaf were out in the lane, and it was very apparent that the Slainers were going for their top lane tower. If they could have found a way to just dive in as five together and all just focus the tower, they could potentially have taken it down. I mean, they dropped it down to, you know, a third HP, 950 hit points. A few more seconds of auto attacks from all of them would have definitely killed it. So unfortunately for them, their gambit didn't pay off. And then just not, not thinking every single step through. You know, they got to a tower and went, okay, I'm on my tower, I'm safe here. Yeah, you might be safe in the ranked queue or in solo queue, but against a 5v5 team that's traveled all around the world, played in every single major event that there is to play in, they know what to look for, they know what to expect, and you know, for them it's a simple poke. We know you're recalling, we know you're low, we know you can't fight, so I'll poke this tower, take one tiny tower hit, and if you're there, I'll kill you. If you're not, well, I haven't lost anything because I'm going to recall as well. So small little mistakes there that cost them a couple of kills. They are still warding furiously. You can see all the red dots over on the sailor's side of the map. And overall, though, they're, they're holding their own. They just unfortunately haven't been able to create the opportunities that they need to to pick up the kills. I like the sense that the sailors know they can't take a straight up fight, and there's exactly why there's a massive laser damage, and the equalizer comes down from Wicked as well. One more harpoon, he gets straight back in, and with a final executing ultimate from the LIP, they do finish off Diana, and now they're 4v5. If they couldn't take a fight before, they definitely can't now. But when CLG called them, rather than just, okay, last ditch, we'll go straight in, they're blowing on Cosmix, pop your Ragnarok, go, they disengage, they can't take that fight, we'll just, we'll just leave, we'll come back a bit later. Their only hope at the moment is to dance around CLG. If CLG go for a Baron, go for the bottom lane. If CLG go for a Dragon, go for the top lane. Just try and stay away from them, pick up global objectives without taking a fight to get back into the position where you then can fight. But honestly, as you said before, CLG just know what to expect. They know what to fight. They know how to counter that kind of play. And it's not going to work yet. They are quite easily too strong now, and I don't think the Seaman can get back into this. Well, they've pulled the Baron now, 6,500 HP. So they can kind of carry on focusing the rest of the Seaman. They're going to get you a little bit late. There's a bit of hesitation. Nobody's really sure where they're coming up. The rest of the team is going in the middle lane. Jerry's going to get caught up. Look at the damage. Life Binding Prismatic Barrier. Ignite is ticking away. We're going to join the team fight now. Janna has gone down to Frog and Kessel forced to Valkyrie away. Krepil is going to carry on chasing. That's one versus two. He is not afraid of Corky. Flash, Shield of Daybreak, stun Kestrel up. True Shot Barrage goes across. Doesn't manage to catch anybody, but a beautiful Life Binding does. Followed up by the Zenith Blade, that's going to hold him in place. Froggen with another kill this time round onto the Corky, the Kestrel, or Corky playing Kestrel, etc. Nevertheless, going to carry on with this pressure. Light Binding goes out, doesn't snare anybody this time round, and Cotton X needs to be very, very careful. He does not have Ragnarok available. If he gets caught by any of this crowd control, it's going to result in him going down. A 6 0 3 Lux, 6 0 Three, uh, Ezreal, they're going to start jumping onto Diana. She's going to be forced to move away. Pale Cascade going to give that damage shield undertow coming across the CLG members. Not going to do anything really. It's just not enough damage. And CLG pick up Baron, pick up an inhibitor, increase their goal to 10,000 at the 30 minute mark, and then a very, very dominant position. The experience of CLG really shining through there. You had the guys in the 760 team, and they were all there with the fire, but one or two of them just getting caught out left and right. Just didn't quite have the back of his team. They weren't quite in that position they wanted them to be. COG were all there, all grouped, all right where they wanted to be. They knew where each other were. Even Yellow Pete was in tanking two, three shots from the, shots from the turret. There was nothing the Seaman did to him for it. Cosmex is going to quickly flash in, in fact, trying to chase onto uh, Frog and Lanzi. Undertow for the slow. They do pick up one. The Shenol's already been used. They're going to keep chasing down onto the rest of CLG. Three people get knocked up, though, by that and a great rupture from Snoopy. They're under this uh, turret in the mid lane, but immediately. Uh, CLG are on the offensive again. Creeper goes in onto JRE. Got a Vendetta on that one. JRE gets feasted by a Snoopy. Kestrel is now in a horrible position. Silence. Trying to flash away. Great knockup by JRE. Might have just saved it. But Kestrel darting to the left. Trying to dodge that Zenith Blade. Will dodge the next knockup. Valkyrie over the water where JRE. Where Snoopy's going to flash to follow. Suddenly finds a Shen here as well. Shen failing the taunt through to the red buff, but they're going to keep chasing Kestrel now down through the tri into the bottom lane. Dodges another great rupture, but Creeper is still on the far side of this wall. He's going to run just outside of the turret range, but Yellow Pete's damage is too much to keep up with it, and Snoopy will finish for the kill. Jerry now does cancel that <laughs> Zenith Blade Dash with his tornado, but unfortunately it's not enough to save his life, and Snoopy grabs a double kill. All that initiated by the 7 c 6 team, and they started that fight. COG lost one member, they lost Froggen, and the other four just turned back on them, started it. 
and won the fight very convincingly without losing any health whatsoever. We do see a great pull forward the Zenith Blade and the stun onto Kotonek from Creeper. So Sebastian goes in the backside of the Yellow Pete. He's trying to burst through him. He doesn't quite manage it in time though with Snoopy picking up another kill. Knockout goes down onto JWell. Yellow Pete's life stealing now back up onto Shen. Kotonek is still here. Another Zenith Blade. There's a great ult from Creeper onto Kotonek. Switching targets to the last second. Giving Pete a double kill and the COG bottom inhibitor turret. Yeah, it's, it's it's insane play there. Cotton X, you know, he got caught out. He was scared. He didn't really want to fight. Sebastian decided to dive in there, tried to pick off Yellow Pete, did a good chunk of damage. Oh, Zenith Blade just missing Kestrel there. But Cotton X didn't commit to the fight. He left, you know, Diana to go in alone. And then, of course, Shen decided to go in. Shen went in, got caught out as well. And then they dived onto Cotton X. You know, it's, it was just going in one by one. If you think to yourself, the laser goes up, not going to be enough to pick up any more kills. But CLG EU, 18 for 33 minutes. GG. I don't what think that really surprises anyone, to be honest. CLG top in their group now, 3-0. They will come out and be our first place.